Hey, thanks for checking out my video. Starting out here with this painting with uh, burnt umber, yellow ochre, ultramarine blue, sap green, titanium white, cadmium red, cadmium yellow, and linseed oil. And I'm just pre-mixing a little bit of paint. And uh, this is, I think, the sixth episode of Study the Greats, my Study the Greats series. It's going to be a longer term series where I try to... Um, decodify some paintings that I find uh, done by some of my favorite painters. This one is done by George Innes. The name of the original painting is Sunrise. And I'm going to work my way through on this 5x7 uh, panel, wood panel, which is gessoed. A couple layers of gesso on there, uh, texturized a little bit, and also a real thin coat of oil paint, a mixture of yellow ochre, burnt umber, and a gray. And I'm mixing my paints on a dollar store bought foam tray, which I'm using as my palette. And uh, we'll be well on our way in just a few minutes here. So started this painting early in the morning and I have about an hour and a half to two hours to finish. This video is sped up. I just uh, you know, feel like most people don't want to spend more than 30 or, or 40 minutes watching this sort of video. So it's sped up, but the actual real-time progression would have put us at about two and a half hours. So I'm going to block in a quick sketch using, as you saw, a mixture of titanium white, burnt umber, and a little bit of yellow ochre, and a little bit of sap green. And uh, just going to try and very quickly put in the darker shadow patterns within this painting. I will tell you right off the bat, there's a couple of big mistakes that I make. And I chose not to wipe the painting and start over. I might do it again sometime in the future, but you'll see in there, mostly compositional and, and textural. Um, for example, right now, I'm putting in uh, what will be you know, one of the main focal points of the painting, and it's this lovely tree out in the field. And unfortunately, I mistakenly shifted the tree to the right, and it's just a little too close to the center of the painting. With that said, I think it comes along you know, pretty nicely. I'm able to get some effects that uh, I've never tried before. And you, know, you could at least see that it resembles you know, the great George Ennis's work. Obviously not nearly at the, the level of skill or quality, but you know, this, is, this is a long journey that we intend to be on here, learning, learning how to paint. And uh, yeah, I thank you again for, for joining me. We're getting to the point now where we can see the basic composition starting to come together. I am uh, establishing the foreground hints of the cloud formations in the sky. You can see what roughly looks like uh, an object that might be a tree. And... Uh, yeah, I'll do a couple of other things here just to give hints to some of the structural elements of the composition by wiping away a little bit of, of the paint here and there with a shop towel and a little bit of linseed oil. The paint that I'm applying right now is extraordinarily thin. Uh, it's just a tiny bit of pigment basically uh, within a lot of linseed oil so it's almost almost like painting with watercolors or gouache uh, that's the consistency of the paint that i'm putting down right now and quite a few times that pigment suspended in the oil will get just a little too thick a little too watery a little too runny and i you'll see i'll come back with a paper towel and and wipe it off in the middle of the painting there, bending behind this large uh, brush on the left and the tree in the, toward the middle of the painting, there is a body of water, and that's where I scraped that little lighter area. And one of the challenges, it's interesting, that I found 
while working out this painting was the uh, size. And uh, so it is five inches by seven. It's a birch panel that I had uh, cut to that size. And you know, what I tried to do um, is uh, use my own version of a process that I saw M. Francis McCarthy use to build his own panels. Basically consists of you know, getting the desired panel, applying gesso. There's three layers of gesso. You sand in between each application. And then I use that mixture of paint that I described earlier uh, to cover uh, the sanded gesso. You know, I'm, I'm excited um, to see at this point, you know, some of the effects I'm going to be able to get on this surface. But I, I'm also a little challenged because I, I typically paint quite a bit larger than this. I think the smallest that I've painted, um, a, a, a painting at least a study like this, or more complicated painting like this uh, might be 12 inches by 12 inches. So this is considerably smaller. More often than not, uh, um, painting on a you know, on a format that's usually 24 by 24. Or, uh, actually, my most recent painting, which was an original painting, was three feet by four feet. So I'm kind of all over the place when it comes to the scale of my paintings lately. But right now, I'm, I'm going through and I'm putting in a wash of largely sap green there might be a little bit of burnt umber mixed in and once again a lot of linseed oil so this is a, a very very uh, thin watery paint right now um, you know no chemicals other than that linseed oil and uh, just layering in some of that darker green and uh, now wiping it away and you'll see me do this throughout this whole process I'll put paint down, I'll, I'll wipe it up, or I'll smear it a little bit. And, uh, you know, the intention here is to build layers of, of paint and work toward desired effects, you know, to create the illusion of luminosity, moodiness, and depth on this uh, two-dimensional canvas. So I went back to my palette loading up some some more green so this scene uh, for the most part is uh, highlighted by the fact that it's a, a backlit scene so any of the shrubs most of the grass that tree in the in the foreground here uh, all will uh, be quite dark because they're in their own shadow and you don't see it quite yet. There's only a little hint of a lighter spot toward the horizon line uh, on the right-hand side, which suggests that there might be some lighter area there. That is where uh, the sun is actually gonna be peeking up over the horizon, hence the, the original title, Sunrise. So there will be some hints of light reflecting off some of these areas that are uh, backlit but it'll be ever so slight so I, I yeah just recently uh, started reading up a lot on uh, tonalism and these fellows that uh, you know were referred to as tonalists George Ennis being one of them later in his career Charles Eaton being one, and there's there's several others. You know, what I've come to develop an appreciation for is how much time and effort they put into getting their paintings right. Yeah, at first glance, especially somebody who is uh, relatively new to oil painting, you know, I know I didn't have an appreciation for the amount of work that they put in and thought that they put in to get the effects that ultimately resulted from their efforts. You know, I've at this point heard anecdotally stories about George Innes basically sanding down large portions of paintings that were perfectly acceptable, if not considered wonderful and magnificent by many, because 
he wasn't able to get it quite as perfect in certain areas as he wanted to. Now, I totally can understand that. Um, I will tell you, I am not quite yet there where I feel like uh, if, if, if I'm not able to achieve with a high level of precision um, that I'm going to wipe out a whole painting. I, I don't have any fear against doing that. I love the idea of painting the same painting over again. Um, I just feel as though I learn more by staring at uh, what I would consider my own mistakes at times. So uh, I'm not quite to the point where I'm going to be wiping down or sanding down nearly completed paintings in order to be able to reset the foundation of the painting and get it, you know, get it right. I might do that for a commission, but for a study like this, I'm quite a bit less fussy. I'm just trying to better understand the process and approach that some of these great painters took when they create these paintings or created these paintings. You may have noticed I started mixing up a very, very uh, diluted, diluted with linseed oil, of course, uh, diluted mixture of ultramarine blue and titanium white and started applying it to the sky. And you'll see throughout the entire painting, I'll apply some version of this color uh, to the painting. And you know, very often I'll put it down and then quickly wipe it up carefully just patting, uh, trying to take care not to smear it into the yellow ochre uh, because that'll create a, a greenish color that we just don't want to see in the sky. And if you've watched any of my other videos, you'll hear me reference this uh, a lot in those as well. But we're really at this point going to start working through what I would call, or what I frequently call, a weaving process where I just work my way throughout different sections of the painting. I'll go from the foreground to the midground to the background to the sky and then back through that sequence, not in any particular order. And I do that um, intuitively, but I've come to find that it, it does help ensure that uh, there's a better chance to achieve balance in the painting, both with color and composition and the tonal qualities of the painting as well. So I'll never stay in one area for too long. Definitely not working to protect, uh, uh, perfect or, or finish any one area at any given time. You know, just laying in colors and uh, you usually... I, I paint very intuitively, um, and that can get me in a heap of trouble when it comes to uh, you know measuring tone correctly or color or mixing color. But uh, you know I find you know one of the biggest reasons that I paint is because it it helps relax, uh, helps helps me relax. It helps quiet my mind. Uh, it helps me connect to things that I hold dear. Uh, nature is one of them. You know some of my best memories. Uh, as a child and as an adult have been, you know, while while taking hikes or, you know, being outdoors at a ball game or a picnic and uh, or on a fishing trip or a camping trip. So, you know, by focusing on this subject matter, you know, I find that uh, it just has a, a profoundly helpful effect on my outlook. And, um, you know, so, so the bottom line is I'm not going to let you know, intentionally, I'm not going to let my concern for becoming a better painter interfere with the joy uh, and the pleasure that I get from actually doing it. So, uh, you know, hopefully that's something that if you've watched this video this far, you can incorporate into your practice as well if you decide to start to paint or if you paint. You know, it really is an activity that can be very helpful uh, in the effort to reduce stress if you approach it, I guess, from the right perspective. If if you allow yourself to fixate on the things that don't go well and the things, 
you know, that don't come out just right, you know, it becomes almost like a job. So anyway, I'm just, I refuse to let myself go there. And, uh, you know, part of that probably has to do with the luxury of me not needing my income from painting uh, to survive uh, because I, I, I do work full time uh, and, and I have another career. So, you know, it's, it's, it's I guess, one of the benefits of, of doing this as a, a vocation, I guess, of sorts. As mentioned, still weaving my way through the painting. You saw me uh, layer in what was almost a pure yellow ochre, maybe with a little bit of titanium white at, at different times and going back through with the blue and uh, just put in a little white spot where uh, the sunrise is going to be peeking through the haze on the horizon, kind of sitting nestled on top of that haze and I put white in there thinking that I might leave it and let it dry and then come back and do uh, you know, a traditional glaze effect in that white spot to get the, the look that I'm going for with the sun. But uh, I guess a little bit of a spoiler alert. I'll take a chance and I'll try to go ahead and get the sun laid out the way I envisioned it going a little bit sooner while the paint is still wet so it'll be wet on wet and uh, all the work that you see here on this video will be uh, wet on wet painting we always reserve the right after a painting's dry to go back to it and make adjustments and one of the cool things and I learned this uh, there's a couple of painters and instructors that are online one of them is Stuart Davies who I've referred to many times and you know he uh, is one of the painters that I watched that helped in, embolden me uh, you know when it comes to my mindset for paintings that have kind of been sitting for a while in my studio and have dried and uh, actually start have started recently to do quite a bit of work in in the area of going back to paintings and making little tweaks on those paintings that have dried by adding glazes and by scrumbling uh, in an attempt to enhance either the three-dimensional illusions that we've created in the paintings or just the overall, um, you know, kind of mood and tone within the painting. There's some really cool things you can do with glazes. That won't be part of this video. This is all, again, wet-on-wet -wet painting. While I'm working through this, I just can't help but but chuckle a little bit and appreciate the fact that you know technology's evolved to the point where you know, life can be considerably easier than than it once was. You know, here's an example. Right now, I'm editing this video while watching my daughter at her soccer practice. And I'm doing it in the cab of my truck using my smartphone. So. You know, just one of the wonders of the world. As destructive as technology can be, it seems, these days, you know, I guess this is one of the good aspects of the technology that we have at our disposal. I just went through and almost with a uh, dry brush technique, uh, just peppered in some additional blue in the sky. And I think I, I pretty much leave that as is. Uh, we'll just kind of let that set and it'll shine through the ribbons of golden yellow ochre tinted clouds and um, doing the same thing almost with a dry brush going around with a mixture of burnt umber and sap green and just making sure that you know, I build in layers of color and tone but um, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm, I'm building up uh, layers in those darker areas of brush and foliage. And eventually, you know, I'll work to darken that gradually in the darkest shadow areas. And uh, it's, you know, what, what I found was, I wouldn't say I was surprised, but 
um, I was, I would say I was pleasantly surprised by the effect, especially toward the end of this video where the painting is almost complete that I was able to achieve by working to modulate how dark that foreground and, and mid ground area is and the effect that it has on the sky. Because, you know, one of the things that, uh, you know, I'm learning and relearning and I'm sure I'll continue to relearn on my painting journey here is, you know, these, these colors and these tones, you know, they relate to one another. So, it, you know, you could have a shape on one side in the corner of a painting and it could have an effect, a meaningful effect on another area within the painting. And in this case, uh, this foreground really has an effect on the uh, the quality that the viewer has uh, the quality of their experience when it comes to observing the sky and the luminosity with the sky and you could almost see it now but it really starts to take shape at the very very end of this video at the time of this painting this little study I'm doing here uh, Mr. George Ennis we are just starting spring. It's 2021. You know, we're coming out of this COVID-19 pandemic and, you know, the weather's getting nice. And you know, I have it in the back of my mind that I would really love to take some long hikes and do some plein air painting on site and, you know, create some video content as well. We'll see. We'll see how that goes. Yeah, I think I would probably spend my time hiking in and near the, the Delaware Water Gap uh, National Park right on the border of New Jersey and, and Pennsylvania. And there's also some, some wonderful parks too, uh, Promised Land State Park uh, here in the Poconos. And uh, there's some spots really close by as well that uh, you know, I might try and fit in. The logistics are a little tough to figure out, so I, I have a, um, I, I don't have like a really uh, good camera that would be appropriate for that, but um, you know, I do have a GoPro, I believe it's a Hero 3, so it's an older version, they might be up to Hero 6 at this point, I, you know, I won that not too long ago. Um, and I've never really used it. So I might start incorporating that. Uh, I also have been shopping around for digital camcorders. And I think it'd be interesting. We'd be able to document the, the hike itself, some of the details about the, you know, the trail, and then also, uh, you know, kind of build in a little bit of a painting video. So at this point, of the painting, you know, I'm, I'm stepping back and, and making some observations. And if you, you haven't noticed, I, I normally do paint vertical on a canvas, but when I'm doing smaller format paintings like this, whether it's a 12 by 12 or this five by seven, I will lay it down on the table uh, only because the easels that I have, um, you know, that fit in my studio really don't accommodate uh, the size format this you know format this this small so what I do is I roll out some uh, contractor paper on my drafting table you know it's at a very slight angle and uh, just work on top of that you may have noticed I took the step to incorporate uh, cotton swabs and if you've watched some of my past videos, you you may have seen me utilize cotton swabs. I think there's a um, a George Ennis study that I had done prior of the Delaware Water Gap, where the use of the cotton swab was was uh, front and center, a pretty prominent part of that process. Here, yeah, I started utilizing it just now, which is probably about two thirds of the way through the process. and I'll use it intermittently from here on out. I'm just coming through and building up some of that blue again in the sky. We wanna make sure we don't lose it. At the same time, 
doing the best we can to ensure that it doesn't mix too much with the yellow ochre and create uh, you know kind of a muddy green I'm reinforcing some of the reflections off of that water and I'll tint that a couple different colors throughout the rest of the painting so as to ensure that it's not um, you know giving off the appearance of being almost pure white I'll also shape that and create some similar effects off into the distance as well. Right now, I'll spend considerable time reshaping the foliage on that tree. Like I mentioned earlier, one of the pitfalls of painting intuitively is sometimes you, you kind of drift a little bit too far into some of your own assumptions that you hold within your own mind and and that's what happened here I I built out that foliage on that tree and it almost looks like it's round and in the in this painting it has more of a I would say the broader outer shape of the tree and its foliage and the canopy, the tree canopy, and and and, and its full fullness is um, kind of heart shaped. And what I have here, it almost looks like a uh, a palm tree or a firework. And you know, I'll have to work pretty hard to reshape that. And you know, it's it's quite all right because one of the interesting effects that I I really um, and just beginning, I'm in the nascent phases of understanding is um, the way with which painters like Innes and a few others um, that I've noticed, they get this incredible uh, dappling effect, uh, which, which really does a trick on the brain. It, 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 um, basically, they work back and forth on the edge of the foliage within a tree back and forth on that that line between the sky the background and then the the edges of the foliage back and forth and back and forth and what it does is it creates the the illusion of uh, what's really hard to describe that we see in nature it's an effect we see in nature where um, yeah, the light tends to filter through the foliage um, at the end of a tree's branches a little bit more fully than it does toward uh, the middle of the, the center of the tree or the center of the foliage. And that's simply because the layers of foliage are a little bit thinner. They might be uh, smaller or more sparse. You might have some branches sticking out so it just creates this interesting effect when you work back and forth um, between the edges of the shape and the negative space that it's cutting into and I like the effects that I'm able to get by trying to do that here but I, I, again it's it's really early in my experience of using techniques like this so my hope is that I'll I'll be able to get much better at it over time. So I'm getting a little tired of talking and you're probably getting tired of hearing my voice. So we're going to take a little bit of a musical interlude.
you may have saw that I did put uh, some red highlights, almost a ring around the sun, and uh, also put some of that cadmium red mixture in uh, throughout the sky. And um, so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat pleased with you know, how that has come out. And in the meantime, too, prior to the musical interlude, I also talked about that effect, that dappling effect on the edges of the tree limbs where it almost becomes indiscernible to the human eye to really understand where the tree ends and the sky starts. And, you know, I'm starting to get a little bit of that effect just by working back and forth And now working through with my palette knife and creating some textural effects on the tree limbs in the foreground, the mid-ground, and the background. You're just trying to direct the eye to the areas of interest and and also create the illusion of detail. And uh, as I pause to take a step back I come to realize that I need to take a little bit more care to reshape the tree and its limbs I I tried and and failed uh, to some degree uh, to shape that initially with my flat brush and then with a cotton swab I had to go through with a a much smaller flat brush and uh, a little bit of thicker paint in order to create the the shapes that I envisioned having set for the tree trunk and its branches. And once again, working my way through, layering in some dark, rich greens into the foreground, and once again, weaving my way through that tree foliage and uh, you know, trying to create sky holes and uh, you know, kind of sharpen the contrast in some areas between the sky and and the tree itself. And uh, then weaving my way back over with some dark green and burnt umber. And I apologize for the you know the quality of the, the lighting here at this phase of the video. It looks like for whatever reason it's getting a little darker. I'm not sure why. I did record this on my phone. And I think uh, sometimes my my iPhone 11 does have a mind of its own. So, again, my apologies. A good portion of my time and energy from this point through the end of this painting will be spent on darkening the foreground and the shadow patterns within the tree and the foliage on uh, some of the brush on the left. And there'll be other things I'll work on, including the reflections of the water and some of the elements in the sky. But at this point in the painting, I've come to realize that the only way I'm going to get the intensely divine effects that you would normally see you know, at sunset, at sunrise, or at dusk, uh, in, in the sky, is if I if I enhance the contrast between the sky and and the, and the ground, uh, because all of this land on this plane that we're looking at really is laying in in the midst of a shadow. Um, and then obviously, because there is some light coming from from the sun, you know, all the all the trees and the brush that are standing up are, are in their own shadow, as we mentioned earlier. So they're going to be extremely dark as well, at least in comparison. And there you can see almost that heart shape uh, in the foliage of the trees. You know, a little bit of a bad cut there. Um, I did take a little bit of a break and uh, came back to this painting. Now you can see I'm, I'm adding some almost like a peachy orange uh, to some of the clouds just to add some complexity to the the warmth or the warmer tones within the clouds and also create the 
the illusion that, um, you know, some of those sun rays are, are kind of dancing in and amongst and through uh, the clouds themselves. And I think, you know, with about two minutes left, you know, what I'll do is I'll, I'll just, you know, remind you if you've made it this far and you're getting any utility out of this video, if you're enjoying it, you find any of the information useful, you know, please uh, go ahead and smash the subscribe button and like this video and share it. Uh, you also, you know, you might want to check out some of the other videos that I have on my YouTube channel, which you could also access on my website, which is uh, thomasmichaelneiman.com. And starting later this spring, I will be doing uh, some instructions, live instructions. Uh, they will likely consist of some sessions being done on Zoom. Uh, just because of concerns with, you know, the COVID pandemic and, you know, wanting to be very careful and mindful of everybody's unique scenario they might be in who might be interested in working with me um, through some painting lessons. They're going to be beginner painting lessons. So, yeah, we're going to we're going to pick a subject matter and work through it together. And uh, here we have what is this George Innes study of uh, sunrise almost done. I'm going to let it dry. And I might go in and put in a few glazes. But this is pretty much it. I appreciate you watching. Thank you so much. Take care. And have a great day.